pom 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 It has become that time again for Stan and Marshall to do their podcast, talking, drawing, and picture making. Sometimes not. Sometimes they wander off. Topic, 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 topic. It's dressing shoes. Yeah. Hi, Stan. Hey, Marshall. How you doing? I haven't seen you since fatherhood became since new fatherhood became a part of Second your life. Second fatherhood. How are you? I'm great. <laughs> I want to hear. I've been getting some sleep lately. Quinn is a great sleeper. <laughs> it's exciting. You know, first three weeks were hard, of course. You know, wake up every two hours. Yep. But, you know, after three weeks, she started to uh, sleep longer and longer every night. And now she's sleeping like seven hours straight. So, I'm happy. I've, I've got my sleep. I'm ready to do this. That's fortunate. Yeah. That with a baby, how old now? She just turned two months a few days ago. How is Melissa doing? Melissa's doing great. Um, so, I, I, my paternity leave is done officially yesterday. So, I'm transitioning back into work. Did you work during these last two months? No, not really. Like once a week, I'll take like an hour. Um, but I would check my emails on my phone, you know, but no, it, it was like 99% family. It was, it was good. I needed it. Yeah. Before I left, we were joking that it was going to be a vacation. Yeah. Um, it kind of was. Okay. <laughs> it really was. You know, the second one is not as hard as the first one. Huh. It was easier. We knew what to expect. And Quinn is just a really good baby. Um, she's great. Whether the second one is harder or easier depends entirely on the second one. <laughs> and the second one, also on the first one. Oh, yes, that's too. Who do you have to compare to? Cooper's a great big brother. Mm -hmm. Good. He's getting a little jealous sometimes, but overall, he loves her. He, he gets too excited to be around her. You know, he's a little aggressive because he's wow. so excited to play with her. I hope for good things with yeah. that. And there's how much difference between? Is it three years? Three and a little bit, yeah. Three years. Congratulations. Thank you. How about you, Marshall? What have you been doing? Well, I haven't talked to you much. For those of you who think that Stan and I have been conversing during this hiatus, we have not. We had one short phone conversation a week ago to schedule the time that we're going to talk about and what we're going to talk about. And the subject was... What was the subject that we're going to talk about today? As far as I know, we're going to be talking about our favorite books, right? Or is it books we recommend or books we've read? They don't have to be art instruction books and they don't have to be collections of artists' work and they don't have to be nonfiction, which is almost all we've reviewed so far, yeah. right? They can be any they books. They can be any books. And I guess we should start off by saying that this episode, you know, we're not going to be talking about a lot of the books that are like the greatest books that artists should have because we've already talked about them so much. Mm -hmm. But of course, if this was a one-off episode, uh, there would be a lot of other books on the list here that are not going to make it. Um, and be, and you guys, well, we'll have links in the description to our other episodes about books. We did an episode on all about learning how to uh, do perspective. Uh, episode on anatomy, all the books about anatomy, figure drawing. Um, and then we did some book reviews as well. I think, I believe three book reviews, Art and Fear, The War of Art. And then I did um, uh, the Josh Waitskin book, um, The Art of Learning. I don't think that was a separate episode, but I did like a 15 minute review at the end of another episode. But we'll have links in the description and we, we've done a bunch of, but so, we're going to skip a lot of the classics you guys are probably looking forward to hearing or not looking forward to hearing about. Even though we did the anatomy reviews, uh, I did not have my copy of the Stratura Woma. I don't know if you have. Yeah, I have these books. This one, you have this one, but you don't have this one, right? What's that one called? Volume 2, and you have a uh, one on motion, but when I looked through it, I could not find the images that I was looking for, which was bodies in motion. Yours had the, the motion of limbs. This is actual locomotion, and it has some amazing plates 
of figures moving like what you'd get in the Mybridge and the Thomas Aikens images. And uh, I've just gone through, I've looked through these again lately, and they have such amazing drawings in them. I believe we mentioned the Satoru uh, Omo books, though, in the anatomy episode. Yeah, we, we tried to cover every anatomy book that we, we thought was worth mentioning. But that was one, though, that even this week, I've been spending time, you asked me what I've been doing, I've been dealing with classes a lot. And we've had a good semester in a couple of the classes, great semester in a couple of the classes. Uh, but I've also been looking at the books on my shelf and the books in boxes in the garage and the books that are distributed everywhere in my life. <laughs> and uh, oh. people keep asking about the books behind me. And could we go through your bookshelf? And that's what this episode is kind of about, yep. except let me say how it isn't. We're going to go through my bookshelf in a draftsman podcast. If I just pull down this Durer one that I've seen <laughs> over my head over and over, just that book alone is worth an entire podcast. So we would be a year or two along with it. But I have a solution for how we're going to get through all of my books and I'll, I'll deal with it at the end of the podcast. Okay. Wait, wait, are we actually going to try to get through all of your books? No, not in this episode. It's... <laughs> There, no, there's another thing. These are arbitrarily here because in March when the lockdown happened, I had to get bookshelves into this studio. And so these books that I put up here are mainly the ones that were sitting on top of boxes and that were available to me that I could get into here. I didn't open up that many boxes. So a lot of these are design books. Uh, I had my graphic design collection uh, accessible. I'll talk about them more as we go on. What's your strategy? You, you said you have a strategy to get through it. Here is the strategy. If you really want reviews and insights into the books on my shelf. <laughs> I know where this is going. Just go to my blog, my website. No, not my website. My, the cl I teach classes. Ah. That's what I do. And I, we, we, we recommend books. At the beginning of a class, I make a recommendation of books that are must-reads for this topic. And then the other ones that aren't must-reads, I can give you my reviews and the pros and cons of them. Even with perspective, uh, we're doing that workshop, a perspective starting in January, and I've got a box full of books on perspective. I am going to pull them out. We're going to uh, we're going to assess which ones are the easiest and the most entry level, which ones are the most advanced and don't start with them. So we just need more time than a podcast to cover any one of course. topic or even any one yeah. book. The books that we do talk about in this episode, you'll be able to find links where to buy them at martialart.com slash mybookshelf. In this episode, we're just going to blaze through them, right? We're just going to try to go through as many books as possible without going into detail about them, right? And then people can do their own research. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. There's so many. I don't yeah. know. Anyway, I think we should just get started. How should we do this? Should we work in categories? I have a few categories, uh, mainly two. <laughs> two categories. What are they? Um, and then I have subcategories, but uh, the, the main ones are art books and then yeah. other, <laughs> which the other books are more like uh, self-help, you know, self-improvement, business and marketing, that kind of stuff. So, it's... Things that really do um, help artists, but not in ways of creating art. It's all the other things artists have to mm -hmm. be good at and do. But it's mainly art books and nonfiction then, right? Mostly nonfiction. Yeah, I, I have almost no fiction books on here. I have three not or three fiction books at the end, just as a thing, like fun, fun ones that I really like um, mm -hmm. to kind of end it off with. But yeah, th these are all nonfiction. These are... I personally read maybe like 99% nonfiction books because when I read, it's mostly to like get better at something or learn about something. Yeah. My fiction is movies and TV shows, I, you know. Yeah. What about you? Are, you, are yours going to be mostly nonfiction? Uh, I think they, they will be, although there's some very important fiction books in my life. But, you know, I'm old and I've got a list of hundreds of books that have been important to me. And uh, I think maybe if we started some with, with series, let me go first. Okay. Okay. Uh, this, this Durer book that I mentioned, 
It is a book about Durer with tons of his work in it. And Dover publications have all sorts of reproductions of his work. But there are series of books, Time Life, uh, I don't know what their quality is like now, but they put out books in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. They'd come in slip covers. And this one, they have a whole series on artists, The World of Durer. And The World of Durer, and some of these you can get really cheap, they have not only good reproductions of his work in the book, they also talk about the context and his life and how things happened. And these are wonderful introductions, mostly to European artists. Uh, that that old these old Time Life series are some of the best uh, overview of a number of the artists that you will then expand later. And uh, I love series of books. There are also Time Life in the 60s did a nature series. And again, you get these, I would pick these up at thrift stores uh, where they'd be 20 cents a piece or something like that. But this one, when I first started teaching animal drawing, I read every word of this book and I spent maybe a month in it. It was so insightful. Of course, it's not the modern knowledge about primates, but it was what they knew up to that time. The reason why I like them so much is that they were just so well written and so well edited that they were like a series of books are like a season of podcasts in that they've got so much in them, but better than a season of podcasts. And there are a number of series that I've collected and haven't yet gone through. And some of the ones behind me here are from these big ideas books. When a company like Dorling Kindersley, who does the eyewitness books, let me show the eyewitness books. Sorry that I'm moving all around to do this. Uh, the eyewitness books are like, they're like encyclopedia entries, but they are about the thickness of your finger. And when you open them up, they are filled with pictures so that the kid in you that wants lots of pictures in a book will have lots of pictures, but there is enough type in there. There's enough copy in there. Sorry, the, uh, my, my microphone is probably uh, uh, blanking out. Uh, there's enough copy in these books to keep you informed, and they're very accessible. Well, they also have some that are even more aimed toward grown-ups. When you have the audacity to name a book the literature book, <laughs> that's I figured I bought I bought about 15 of these things because I figured that's a way to sit down and get an education in a topic where the editors did their best to make it accessible to a person who is new to the topic and make it infuriating to a person who already knows so much about this topic that they get upset about what was left out and have opinions about it. So, these are books that are like, one book is about horses and then you open it up and it's just like everything you want to know about horses with pictures and, and stuff like that. Yeah. So, yeah. these are books that if, you, if yeah. you're like a concept designer or, or whatever, you need to learn about your subject. And this is like an encyclopedia yeah. for artists type of thing. That is what they're like. Yes. Cool. They're, they're, they can't be as rich as the uh, the internet, but they are... Right. <laughs> when they're well edited, and the Dorling Kindersley's books are, are pretty well edited. When they're well edited, they mean that you're going to be sitting down with a group of experts who are going to gently take you through a lot of stuff. They're great for macro overviews of a subject. Yeah. Yeah, I was going to say, like, this was great probably in the 90s, but now every artist is just going to Google horses instead of buying a book on horses. That's right. Um, but yeah, like you said, they, they do, it's edited, um, but so is the Wikipedia article. Or, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, you're you're right. It's I, I don't think it's any kind of an argument for, it is a love yeah. of sitting down with something that's made out of wood. 
Yeah. And that it's it's there's just something about opening a book and saying I've got one or two hours where nobody's going to bother me mm-hmm. and I'm not looking into a computer screen or onto a pad. I'm sitting here reading something that light reflects off. I can be anywhere I want to. Uh, I just I love that. Yeah, I agree with you. Absolutely. Like I, I actually when I was preparing for this episode, I'm, I was going through my bookshelf and I realized that like 30 percent of the physical books that I own are actually just books of art, collections of art. It's like, you know, Nikolai Feshin and it's just like all of his art or not all, you know, a collection of his art. Um, yeah. Morgan Wise, whatever, who, choose an artist and it's just like this guy's art. Uh-huh. Basically, this entire section, I know people listening can't can't see it, but it's it's three rows of books um, and it, that's like at least 30% of my books. Yeah. I think that says something about at least how I studied, um, mostly by just looking at great art and studying it. Yeah. I look at the the books, the art instructional books that I've read and it's like, it's not that many. They're, they're, they'll fill up one shelf that, you know, the books that I've actually just like studied, mm-hmm. instructional books that I've studied. And everything else is just like reference that I need to get inspiration and if, I, if I'm if i having a problem and I, I need to figure out how to paint something, I'll, I'll open up a book by an artist that I admire and just see how that artist solves it instead of trying to figure it out intellectually by uh, going to an instructional book. Yes, it's a great way to do it. Uh, so, art in, when you say art books then, we've got two divisions within art books. We've got art instruction books. And we've got collections of artists' work. One way to know what the most important collections of artists' works is, is in a fire. If you've only got a minute or two, which ones do you go for? I would go for the expensive ones so that I could, recreate, you know, cheaply recreate it later. Let's not say expensive ones. <laughs> yeah. Let's say that this is a, this is a situation where you're never going to have access oh, to this okay. again. Yeah. These are these are desert island books. Oh, geez. Here, let me let me turn around for a second. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's the first time I've ever had Stan turn his back to me during a podcast. You like what you see? Oh yeah, it's it's a statement. Okay, some some that stick out. Definitely a, a fashion book. That, you're right about that. Which one? I, I want to know if it's the one that I borrowed from. Well, I only, I think I only have one and it was good enough for me. It was this red one. It, it's just filled with reproductions of his pencil portraits. And, yeah, that's, yeah, yeah, that's yeah, yeah, the yeah. That's, one? that's okay, the one? Cool. Oh, well, gosh, good thing I got a good one. What a great book. Yeah. It's, it's all in Russian here, so I don't know. We'll, we'll have links. Um, yeah. Uh, so, Nikolai Feshin, probably also Repin, Ilya Repin. Um, so, those are the two mm-hmm. Russians I would choose. Which Ilya Repin I, book? Jeez, oh, I have like four of them. I don't know. The biggest okay. one. <laughs> you can put the pictures and the links on, yeah. the, uh, uh, on, yeah. on the screen. I'll probably yeah. choose an illustrator or two, Dean Cornwell, Leindecker, and Rockwell. Mm-hmm. I got to throw in one of the Kim Jong-gee books in there just to make the, you know, keep things interesting. Yeah. Probably the naughty one. <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> it's a desert island. Yeah, desert island. I'd say that's it for the as far as artists. Mm-hmm. I, otherwise, I'm just going to go on forever. But there's, I also want to say that there is also a um a really good source of inspiration are art of books. Um, like if you if you like the concept designs of a movie or a show, sometimes you can find books where they have the concept art of. The cre- you know, creation of that movie. One of my favorites is uh, Tarzan. Yes. The, the Disney animated movie. I have several. I have just Art, art of Pixar where they, just, they go through several movies. Art of Up. Uh, but a- anyway, like I- I'm hoping that they're going to have uh, the Art of the Mandalorian. You know the show Mandalorian? No, I don't. Yeah, maybe they already have a book on that. But like at the end of every episode, they go through like cons- they, they show a bunch of concept art. That was done for that episode, and it's it's they're so good. Is it animated or or live action? It's a live action show. It's on Disney Plus. It's it's new. It's a Star Wars uh, kickoff, I guess. Okay. It's a, it's a really good show. 
but yeah, great concept art. Maybe they already have a book on it. If not, when it comes out, I'm going to get it. The other one that's similar to like the art of, but it, it's, no, it is an art of, but a little bit more than that is the Norman Rockwell behind the camera. I think we've mentioned it in the past, but oh, yeah. it's, it's not just his art, but it's also his reference photos alongside the art. And that addition is so useful for artists because we get to see um, how he changed things, um, the decisions that he made, and, and it's just like a little insight into the process. It is. It's wonderful. It's the same thing why I think the art of and movies books are good because you're not just seeing finished stuff. You're seeing the way these artists solved problems. You're seeing their process. You're seeing not just the, the concept that they did that ended up being in the movie. You're seeing all the ones that, they, that didn't get chosen as well. All right. Um, and so, you're seeing like this, you know, they failed and they improved on it. Um, they're probably being picky as well. They're choosing the best of the ones that didn't get chosen. Um, but it's still, you're, you're seeing sketches, just uh, the way they got to of the final result, which for students that are learning to do concept art, it's really important to see that kind of thing because it's, they're, instead of seeing step 10, they're seeing step two, step four, step six. They're seeing somewhere in between and that's something to aim for and it, it helped me get into the mindset of how to solve problems through sketching uh, because it's like, oh, that's the goal. Step one is this. That's what I should be thinking about doing and, and mimicking and not trying to go for that final, you know, rendered masterpiece right away. Um, it's problem solving first. What's the composition? What are the values? What are the, what are the characters look like? What are they wearing? Is there a color feel to it? Um, all that stuff you could do through different sketches and that became a really big part of my process for any large project is breaking it up into smaller parts and focusing on each one. Yes, even if the picky choosing about what gets in the book excludes the stuff that wasn't that impressive, they often don't exclude the stuff that was very different. Yeah. And that's a great lesson in creativity is that you head out in this direction and say, that's not the direction we're going to go. You head out in a different direction and you find out that's not the direction we're going to go either. But if we hadn't gone in that direction, we wouldn't have come up with these ideas. And that openness to early exploration, those books often showcase the best of that. Yeah, if you're, if you're a good learner, you can deduce that lesson or uh, infer that lesson just from going through one of those books to say, I would have never guessed that they would have played around with it in that direction. Uh, good, good production designers and art directors also make it a point to hire concept artists that will take it in directions that they weren't intending to go. We've heard that story more than once that a lot of concept artists never get their work in the movie. But that's okay. They still want them on there mm -hmm. because it stretches other people in directions that they hadn't thought of. Yeah, and I, I don't want to keep naming any specifics here. There's so many art of books that, you know, you, you pick your favorites and you go to those, you know. It's, this is just, it's inspiration. Yeah, I have some art of uh, movie books because friends and, and students have been, uh, uh, former students have been artists on the projects. But I'll tell you, my, my favorite collection of art from particular era, eras is Jim Vataboncourt's images magazine stuff and his black and white images. This collection of the black and white images, which are from the golden age of illustration, are just filled with wonderful images and they are out of print. However, they are still purchasable, used, and if you look up BPIB, I think it is, uh, and seek Jim Vadabankur, uh, you'll find that they are available even if out of print. And he also did a series of magazines, the Vadabankur collection of images, in which they, he compiled all this wonderful golden age illustration stuff 
including the unseen and previously unpublished Heinrich Klei work that we showed in that video with uh, Stuart Ng's uh, original sketchbook. But these are collections that have all sorts of different illustrators, many illustrators that we didn't even know who they were, but they were working in the 19 zeros and teens and 20s and 30s. And Jim had this incredible collection of them that he personally worked out all this printing so that they would come out as magazines. And I made it a point when they went out of print to buy an extra copy in case anything happens to the copy that I thumb through. But those are not art of books, but they're lots of different artists of a particular era who did great work. And then one other that I'll throw into there. Yeah. This is also out of print. It's called Dynamic Black and White Illustration. Leslie Kabarga put it together out of print, but the subtitle of it is 100 Years of Line Art, 1900 to 2000. And it's true to its name. It is a century of black and white, mainly pen and ink, but not all pen and ink. I mean, there's woodcuts and, and digital art in here and everything else. But it is just as varied in style as you could ever find. Every way that people put down black lines on white paper. He knows the century. He knows popular art, and he made a great collection. So that's another one that I really recommend for those of you who want to be pen and ink artists. Yeah, I think we could keep going on and on about it. I mean, there's literally thousands of great artists out there. Yeah. The way to go about this is actually to listen to the episode on art parents. Yeah. The art parents you choose, get those books. Yeah. It's so personal. Uh, what other art books you got there, Marshall, and then we'll move on to the next big category of non-art books. Oh, dare, dare you ask. <laughs> one if, minute. If Remember, I knew one that minute. I had to give me just a little Her more. Book. Because the collections of Little Nemo and Slumberland, oh, which I read to my of. son aloud. I know. You love... Okay, that's great. I know. I love Little Nemo but too. I got bought multiple copies of these. These were the main book that I bought. And I bought them partly because uh, I could have one set that I could have the spine cut yeah. out of. And then I'd have loose leaves of these things so that they were easier to get at than in a book. But every time one of these books would go out of a collection of Little Nemo and Slumberland, every time one of them would go out of print, then they'd bring another one into print and then it would sell out and then it would go for a higher price. But I want to show one version of Little Nemo and Slumberland that is something to behold. This version of Little Nemo and Slumberland has everything in it, including the 1920s stuff when he came back to it. And it's printed bigger than a number of previous books. And then Peter Maresca uh, of Sunday Press put together the really big ones that are so big that I don't have them here to show. And I think all of them are out of print, but they're still available. So, that one that you showed, the really big one, that's still available? It's still available used, I think. Okay. I don't know whether it's still in print. Yeah. But these are not cheap. These are these are like over a hundred dollars. Oh, that's and that's huge. The Peter though. Maresca Sunday Press, those are the really big ones, but they're not complete. They're printed at the size that they were originally done in the newspapers. Yeah. If you care about looking at them the way people saw them before they had ever seen color movies, and even the first Little Nemo and Slumberlands came out the year that the first movie theater was built in Pittsburgh. So, people were not used to seeing all the things that we see and Sunday morning when you'd have a great big color comic, it was a major experience for people to lay it out on the floor, kids to lay it out on the floor and to go into these magical worlds. And what is that book? Like, if I wanted to get that Nemo book, what would I type in on eBay or... Look at this opening bit. Marshall's like a little kid right now. This is a Tashin book. Tashin. Okay, cool. Complete Little Nemo by Windsor McKay. Uh, put together by Alexander Braun. As far as instructional art books, do you have any that we haven't already talked about a lot on the podcast? Yeah, but what about when they're out of print? I don't know. People could still find them on, on eBay and stuff. 
Michael Bourbon's Lessons from Michelangelo. Okay. He was Robert Beverly Hale's student. He put together a good book and it has been out of print for some time. I have approached or I, I wrote an email to Dover uh, years ago asking if they would bring it back into uh, bring it into print. They didn't publish it. Watson Guptill published it. Uh, and they said that they would be considering it, but that was many years ago and I don't think they have, but that is a very good book to follow up the very flawed master class in figure drawing. Great book, but flawed because of so many errors in it. Those two are companionate to drawing lessons from the great masters, but I put the three of them together to say that will give you a great deal of information about what the Art Students League in the late 20th century had to offer students for figure drawing. That's good. I've actually never even heard of that one. How about you? I think I've mentioned probably every book at some point in the podcast. I just want to, um, I guess, point out the, the ones that I really, really recommend. Okay. If you're going to be a painter... Uh, especially, you know, wet in the wet oil painting, that classy, the, 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 the juicy a la prima style. I would recommend a la prima by Richard Schmidt. Um, but even if you're not doing a la prima, just it has so much good information about painting in general. Um, I, but everybody knows about that one. If you don't know about it, then get it. Yeah. Um, any James Gurney book. Yes. And then personally, Glenn Vilpu's drawing manual to me was one of the most useful. It's like a more comprehensive version of what you get from other figure drawing books because he takes you through the whole process from your initial marks all the way to what he would consider a, a finished and developed drawing. Yeah. Yes, very accessible. Yeah. Okay, I haven't even mentioned uh, other pen and ink books that are instructional, but this one by Henry C. Pitts of ink drawing techniques, which one of my students uh, reintroduced me to recently. It's not that great a set of examples. It's got some wonderful wisdom about how to be an artist. But because we're covering too many books, all we need to do is have a class at some point where we have a few weeks where the concern is, what do you need to do pen and ink technically? What do you need to do pen and ink creatively and to develop style? And that's where these books that we've mentioned and more can be in your collection and you can say, I've got all the information I need. Now it's a matter of adoring these artists and choosing what I like from them to turn into my own style and then getting to work yeah. on it. There comes a point where books can be, books can work against our productivity and even creativity because all we become is fans. But if they are seen as things to respond to and uh, do our own work uh, using the book as prompts, I think that's the best way to use them if, if the priority is to become an artist as opposed to become uh, more a critic or a fan or just a lover of that art. Yeah, absolutely. And of course, best to be both. I've actually gone back to taking notes while listening to audiobooks. I, I've, I've, the past few years, I've just been kind of listening and not doing anything about it. And I've started really being serious about taking notes while really absorbing anything. Yeah. Um, whether it's reading an article on the internet, um, listening to an interview, watching a YouTube video that's instructional, um, listening to an audiobook or reading a book, anything where I'm learning something, I'm st being strict about taking notes. Um, and so, to me, that has been, I, I immediately noticed how useful it, what it is to take notes. I was like, that's right. Why did I stop? It's it because not only does it, it's like a, a memory, it helps you remember what you did, but it also helps you analyze while you're listening or reading this thing because I noticed immediately that okay I would I would l listen to something that I really liked and I was like okay pause I need to write this down and I would start writing it down and I'd be like wait what was it and so it's like even like 10 seconds later I've already forgotten part of the message and so it really showed me how important it is to 
re-listen immediately and to, until I really understand what this thing is. Why did you stop taking notes? I don't know. I think trying to be too efficient with my time, not realizing that I actually was just wasting time. Um, but it was right. just like, you know, going for a walk and eating while listening to a book not in not having, you know, it, it wasn't very convenient for me to constantly be taking notes because I'm eating, right? Yeah. Or I'm driving and I'm listening to a book. I can't stop every five minutes and write something down. Um, so, I, it would, I was always just trying to be very efficient doing something while also absorbing information. But it's, it's just, not, it's not efficient. It, it's, I, I was lying to myself. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so, yeah. <laughs> focus focus is so much more it's about the quality of information i'm absorbing and how i'm absorbing it and not about just trying to cram as many audiobooks into my brain as possible yeah i found that out this uh last month and a half not from a book so much as from a seminar uh robert mckee's seminar on the genre of the love story which i paid for last year and they were supposed to do it in march but the lockdown uh, set it aside and they kept setting it aside and finally he just did it online. And I, it's, it was only about eight hours of content and yet it took me a month and a half to get through it online because I found that I missed the ritual of staying in a hotel, going there and going into a heightened state of concentration. Now I'm doing this at home mm. and so there can be distractions. But I was aware of that and covering for it by saying, I will give 100% time to this and I can hit pause and type in what I need. But it took me that long, but I also got every single thing out of that genre love story genre, rich with content about what the main genre is and how the different subgenres and how they evolved out of a need to make sense of the difficulties of love relationships. It was a great seminar, even though it was missing the quality of being there. But I think, I don't, I don't know that I would have appreciated what a good seminar it was if I had not sat down and given it 100% concentration and made notes. And I've got about a hundred movies to watch <laughs> in the coming years <laughs> to work out these different variations of how love stories can go in different yeah. directions and also focus on different aspects of relationships. It's one of the problems of reading is that the more you read, the more books get added onto your list to read because <laughs> every book opens up yeah. five more books. Yeah. Yeah, my 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 list just keeps growing. It's I know. It, it's I know I'm never going to get through them. Cuz I add more books to the list than I remove constantly. Yeah. So this kind of brings up the topic, I guess, of productivity and being efficient, not efficient, but focus, right? And there's a few books I have on my list that are about that, about you know, how it's not good to multitask, uh, that sort of thing. Going back to before the internet, right? Like, there, there's things we could learn about the way people used to do things. God damn it, this mouse. <laughs> Jesus Christ, I can't scroll through my notes. <laughs> this doesn't work. This is a this sign that we're work, supposed Marshall. to be reading books. Oh, it's, it's wireless. so good to see you it's struggle It's wireless. That's why it's not working. <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay, so one book, Miracle Morning. Have you ever heard of it? Miracle Morning? Yeah, you, I think you mentioned this. Is this about using your time in the morning? Yeah, it's just about creating a morning routine that gets you, yeah. you know, inspired or energized or, you know, staying healthy, whatever it is, something, whatever that morning is for you. Tell us more. A, a lot of people start their mornings in a way that sets them up to have a bad day, right? They'll, they'll start by waking up, going on their phone, checking their emails and, and that, that's like a, you know, I think I've said it's a to-do list f for you from other people. They'll start by just, right. you know, scrolling the internet or going through their Instagram feed. Instead of solving a problem, focus on yourself first. Um, Figure out what you need to do. What are the most important things in your life right now and focus on that. I'm pretty sure it's not whatever you're going to find in your Instagram feed. 
this is this is very valuable. I mean, to me, when I was really practicing the Miracle Morning, to me, um, some things that were on there were just like, drink a bunch of water, <laughs> right? Like, wake up, have water ready, um, you know, so that I'm hydrated. And I always have this giant bottle of water by my bedside now. Mm -hmm. Doing like 10 minutes of meditation. Um, mm -hmm. Doing some stretches because... I'm always hurting my back because I'm too tight and sitting a lot. Um, going for a run or exercising, whatever it is. Um, just starting your day off with the things that you know are important to you. Uh, maybe it's spending an hour with your son and just just giving full 100% attention to that. Um, the book basically just helps you figure that out. Miracle Morning sounds great and even if it wasn't a well-written book to sit down and give several hours of thought to what do yeah. I do with my morning could be so convicting that it could make me say, this is why you're not doing as well as you could be doing because your morning is happening arbitrarily and not by design for a good day. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned it. This is putting some time and actual effort into figuring out how to spend your time. What do you want to do? What, what's going to help you be the person you want to be? And, and you know, do the, the first two hours of your day, do it doing something important. Mm -hmm. Another one is the one thing. Tell me about the one thing. It, it's about not doing more than one thing at a time. You know, it's about focusing on one ah. thing. It's basically just trying to convince you that multitasking is not good, no matter how much you think it is. Yeah. Great things come from a series of si focuses on single things. It's, you know, you focus on one thing and then the next thing and then the next thing, not all at once. Um, and, and when you create that series of ex uh, very focused things, you can create something really remarkable. I believe in that. And I also think it's quite natural for children who are not exposed to so much media or at least just watching uh, there has I've heard of research there has been research about the effect of so much sensory input mm -hmm. uh having an effect on us but having watched a child focus on one thing until they were done with that one thing and seeing how bright the child got so quickly yes children get distracted and we all get distracted but I I feel more strongly now that one of the most valuable things we can do is to say one hour to two hours, at least 20 minutes to not do anything but this one thing. And, and we've talked about it before, Stan. It's been a regular theme. It's not just that you get the long-term benefit of being able to concentrate and assimilating information. It's also that it is so enjoyable. I find that when I'm distracted by one thing and another thing and another thing and another thing, I don't come away feeling good. I find that when I sit down and get my head into a book for one or two hours, I come away feeling good. That there was a beginning and a middle and an end mm -hmm. to it, that it was a complete experience. Is it a book good enough to where you recommend it? I think so. I mean, just, I, I think maybe just because the, the ideas behind it are so important, in my opinion. I feel like mm -hmm. getting that idea of multitasking out of our heads, specifically for artists, it's so important because um, nowadays we are just constantly training ourselves to be bored with anything that's not giving us that hit of dopamine uh, constantly. And if you want to be a great artist, you have to be able to spend a day focusing on creating your art. There's going to be t times during that day where you're going to get bored with the creation. You're going to want to just like pull out your phone and do something else, but you have to get, um, build up that discipline to be able to focus as an artist on what you're doing. Um, mm -hmm. And it's just, I think the way you know, our society right now is, is working against us in, in that regard and we have to practice. We have to practice not being bored 
with ourselves in a room. <laughs> we have to create mm -hmm. our own inspiration and we have to love making things and focusing on something deeply. And there could be no better time in our history than right now to do that. <laughs> Why so? Because we're locked down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah. I see what you're This is where you have an excuse to say for three hours today, one here, one here, and one here later, I'm going to have time where I don't have to drive yeah. and I'm not going to multitask. I'm going to sit down and get into this thing. Yeah. But I mean, even in lockdown though, like we could, we could just gravitate towards our phone, towards our TV, towards all of the entertainment that we still have at home. Yeah. And it's fine. I, I, I do that stuff all the time, but I, I realize how important it is to be able to have the discipline to focus. Well, I don't have a TV, so I'm I'm I got that That's out of great. my life. But I and I, I have a phone. I have a phone that does not even have my email or anything else on it. I never use the web on my phone. But I have my computer, which is where I'm doing my work all the time. And now I recognize I have enough books to live to be 400 years old and not need any more. Awesome. This one maybe not for everybody. It's a uh, man's search for meaning by Viktor Frankl. I think I mentioned it before. You did. It's a book about the Holocaust. It's about a, a guy that lived through it. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. very graphic, very sad things in the book. Um, but the, the, it really gives you a deep appreciation for life. That's a meditative book. So, I think it's useful for when you need it, when you want that kind of thing. <laughs> mm -hmm. it's, it's not one of those you know, quick hit of dopamine type of books. You're not going to get mm -hmm. <laughs> that rush. Um, but it's, yeah, it's a meditative type of book. You're right. Today's sponsor is BetterHelp. They're an online therapy service that puts you in control of your mental health. With BetterHelp, you get access to over 3,000 U.S. licensed therapists that can assist you with a variety of issues. Anxiety, depression, intimacy problems, and other issues can have a serious impact on your life. Talking with a trained professional can make a difference. And BetterHelp is unique in the sense that you can communicate with your therapist on your own terms. You can conduct sessions by secure video or over the phone. And if talking is not your thing, you can chat or text. On top of that, their rates are affordable and they make sure to find you the perfect therapist to meet your needs. Right now, BetterHelp is offering all Draftsman listeners 10% off your first month with discount code DRAFTSMAN. To get started, go to betterhelp.com slash DRAFTSMAN. Simply fill out a questionnaire to help them assess your needs and get matched with a counselor you'll love. That's betterhelp, H-E-L-P dot com slash DRAFTSMAN. What's another one that's made a difference? I mean, a nonfiction kind of self-help book that has made a difference in your life? Um, this uh, one that, and it's actually kind of related to this being very deliberate with your time sort of thing is uh, The Talent Code. And we both read this together. We read it together. What, like five years ago, I think. And I think I've mentioned, I think we've talked about it on the podcast, but I think it's so important, at least, at least to me, it was very important um, that we should, I should mention it again. It's mainly about just deliberate practice. Um, uh, it's called The Talent Code. Um, but the, the point, I think, of the book is that it's less about talent and more about effort. Um, I don't think he says that talent is not real, but he says that whether you have it or not, you got to still put effort into it um, because we all have the capacity to become great through effort and deliberate practice. Um, a few things that really stuck with me from that book are you know, the, the science behind how our brain learns. Mm -hmm. And I think it is important to know that because our brain is like, it's a tool, right? It, it's a tool that we use to uh, solve problems, to brainstorm decision or, or ideas, um, create paintings. It, it's a tool. We use it to do things. And if with like with any tool, it's good to understand how that tool works. Yeah. Because then you can use that tool more effectively. Um, and so, you know, his explanation of how the brain learns uh, to me was really 
fun uh, and useful, I think. He focused on the chemical aspect of it too, right? Yeah, the myelin and ha- how myelin. basically it's the way to think about it is it's like a capsule through through which your um, your brain waves or what are they called the the signals uh, pass th- synapses. Yeah, they they pass through that, and the more you use any pathway, you know, any and, and a pathway is basically like. You know, you're, you're learning how to crosshatch. That thing, that repetitive task creates a, a series of ch- connections in your brain and the more you go down that connection and repeat it, the more myelin gets wrapped around that and it gets reinforced and the more myelin that gets wrapped around it, the faster it becomes and the more efficient it becomes and it's, it's kind of like uh, a highway and, so, and, and it's like the, the more cars that you you send down that highway, the more lanes you have to start adding to it. Hmm. That's a really bad. <laughs> Hold no, on. no, it isn't. No, I don't think that's a bad analogy. I'm trying to make it the, work The more though. you drive down that highway, the more you do it subconsciously because you cannot consciously tell people turn right on Rancho de Linda and uh, turn left on Via Carlos. <laughs> The more you, you, you don't know those names, but you know when you're driving it without ever thinking of those streets, how to get there because it's in your subconscious mind. And the idea is that doesn't happen until after you've done it a number of times and it becomes subconscious. Okay. But <laughs> let me mention what I liked about the t- talent code. Yeah. Uh, the talent code is if you are the kind of person, a couple of illustrators that were very successful illustrators were interviewed years ago and one of them said, I don't believe in talent. I don't think there's such a thing as talent. It's all hard work and students should get that into their head right from the beginning. And I was thinking, I understand where he's coming from, is that his profession came about from harder work than most people think, but I do believe in talent. Uh, If you are already of that persuasion that it's not about talent, it's about hard work, you don't need the talent code. You're already taking responsibility for the fact that you've got to develop your own talent. But if you do think that it just happens automatically, that book is a good reality dose of how, like a muscle, uh, a muscle changes as you use it. And the brain is a physical entity and it can be measured that chemicals change as we practice with deliberate practice and that we are the ones who must take responsibility for it, not the classes we take, not the books we read or haven't read, uh, and not the talent that we are given. So, I think it's a very good encourager to point us toward falling in love with the process of getting better. There's a lot of focus on that. Can you love this practice time? And if you can, you'll you'll get talent eventually. Yeah, you'll get talent, yeah. Um, I think that I like that book though, not just because it it convinces you that effort is important. Even if you already un- agree with that and you know that, it's still good to read it because it goes deeper than that. It talks about the the most the best ways to study and practice. Yeah, I think this is the book where I got the the, the feedback loop. I don't know if that's what he called it in the book. I know he 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 says deep learning or deep practice. I think it's deep practice. Um, but it, it's essentially a very similar thing. You know, you, you, you fail at something, you pause to observe and you try again. Um, he definitely talks about that but there's more to it. He talks about practicing things as a whole like there's a task and you do the thing completely but then also breaking it up into chunks and practicing chunks separately. And then he talks about playing with time slowing things down to really focus on each part of a motion or each part of the process and then doing things a little bit faster so you just get better at it. Um, and I'm actually um, using this right now, applying this. I'm learning how to swim. Really? I mean, I know how to swim as a ki- from being a kid. I, I know how to swim and I'm, I'm pretty decent at it. I'm, I'm not slow. I have decent technique but I'm learning how to swim better with proper form, um, be efficient, be able to just swim laps for 30 minutes, try to do that, you know. Um, remember how I said I was going to pick up mountain biking? Yeah. 
I dropped that idea. Instead, I started swimming, which I think was the right call. Oh, yeah, yeah that sounds good. Yeah, yeah. I've been going to the YMCA and, and doing laps. I took some, I took a, a few classes. Um, and yeah, there's just so much to the movement. Your arm has to like, you know, enter the water properly. And then as it, go, it goes through the water, you have to scoop it correctly. And like, if you bend your elbow too much, it's wrong. And the way you're, you're, um, you kick with your legs. Like there's so many complex parts to the motion. Oh, and then there's the breathing aspect of it, which if you don't get right, your your brain just explodes because you're not getting enough air and you're like, ah, you start panicking. And so, there's so many little elements to it that you have to break it down and, and practice each one individually slowly. And then you get better and it becomes intuitive. And then you can try to do it really fast and try to like do a lap as fast as you can with proper form and slowing it down and doing it faster together mm -hmm. that's deep practice that's deliberate practice and the more you do that uh the better you'll get and you can apply this to painting to drawing break it up into smaller chunks mm -hmm. do it slowly do it faster but right now you're doing it for yeah swimming. right now i'm doing it for swimming and it's fun i love it it's like a new it's a new thing yeah. that i'm learning <laughs> Yeah, good. Well, you know, this is an aside, but you're wearing a short sleeve shirt. Yeah. And it, it is December 8th, 2020. And I was going to wear a, a nice thick flannel shirt for the uh, holidays, but it's it's 81 degrees here in Laguna Hills. And yeah, I, I mean, 78 over here. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, it's, it's sort of not in the holiday spirit, but here we are. And yeah, swimming in December. Anything else about the talent code? It would be good to read at the beginning of training sessions, yeah. where if we're going to spend a year or two or three, let's get this into our head that we are going to focus on practice deliberately. Yeah. Okay. What are the other ones on this list? Uh, I guess I'll just I'll keep going, Marshall. I'll keep going. I got I got a bunch. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep going. I, I'm I'm interested in every one of them. One of the first ones that I think I've ever read and just got kind of obsessed with was the four hour work week. This was a long time ago. I remember that. Yeah. And you you got it down to a one hour work week recently. Okay. <laughs> That's because I was on paternity leave. Uh, but you're right. You're right. Well, I, I did. Uh, you know, there are th a lot of things that I have applied in my life that got me able to have a business that still runs while I'm on paternity leave for two months and everything still functions. Yeah. A lot of people probably didn't even know I was gone. Uh huh. The point of the book, it's by Tim Ferriss and he's actually got four books out and I think all four are wonderful. Um, some of them are way uh -huh. too long, but they're really good. But the four hour work week specifically, it's not about working less. Um, I think a lot of people have that misconception. It's more about working on the things you want to work on. It's spending less time every week on the things that you just don't want to do, the mundane stuff and working more on just stuff you want to do. If you really like creating art, that doesn't, you know, the four hour work week isn't just, isn't telling you to only do it for four hours because it's your job. Mm -hmm. It gives you strategies to get more done in less time so that you can automate the mundane stuff to focus on the extraordinary things, the things that you really love to do, the things that will make a big difference. Um, that's the purpose of it. And it's the strategies, the specific ones he talks about. Um, it's so interesting, as I was thinking about this book this week to talk about it, I remembered how a really big part of it was trying to convince your boss to work from home. <laughs> <laughs> this, was, this book was written like, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And a big yeah. part of this book was like, Here's how you get your boss to agree to, to, to let you work from home because if you can work from home, yeah. you could be more efficient and you could be anywhere. Your boss doesn't have to know that you're actually in Hawaii right now on your laptop in a jacuzzi doing work, uh -huh. you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is so wonderful because it, it applies right now. It's actually... Mm -hmm. Like, I think it'll be a lot easier to apply these strategies after this is all over because companies are realizing that, hey, people can actually work from home 
and be efficient, sometimes more mm -hmm. efficient. And they can save money on it, overhead. Yeah. Things are still going to need to be figured out because now the uh, the overhead is actually being pushed to the employees because, you know, they're the ones paying for electricity now and more air conditioning mm. because they are at home. Um, but anyway. <laughs> yeah. So, therefore, pay them, pay them more, more money. money. Yeah. The four-hour work week by Tim Ferriss I was first told about by a group of young people in Los Angeles who were high achievers. They were upwardly mobile, young, uh, becoming high mm -hmm. achievers and they sat me down and told me I ought to read this book. I haven't read it and I have anything but a four-hour work week. My work week right now is as many hours as, as it has ever been and I should read it and I should be moving in that direction. Yeah. But I just have not yet. Yeah. I mean, I want to point out that Tim Ferriss works probably 60 hours a week. Mm -hmm. That's But that's not the point. The point is that those 60 hours that he puts into working are the one that he does what he wants to do. He's not yes. doing the things he hates because it has to be done. He's automated them. He's, yeah. um, he's outsourced them or whatever. He has a team. It's about these strategies to get rid of the stuff. Like, for example, I know, Marshall, I've known you for a long time. I know how much time you spend trying to fix your computer. <laughs> There's probably stuff you could let's do to save a year of your life. Uh, <laughs> let's not talk about it. I know. I'm experiencing that yeah, right yeah, now. Freaking mouse. You are. I'm uh, so glad. It makes it so that there's going to be more empathy. Uh, yeah, I, yeah, a forty to sixty, a sixty-hour work week does not sound bad to me. If the, within that sixty hours, there's things like uh, classes of people who are interested in the subject, where we're watching movies and discussing yeah. them and trying to apply things to our projects. That's been a good deal of my work weeks in the last few months, and it's been just I love the job. I love it where we we're going to say we're going to take a three-hour break. We're watching these movies on our own. We're going to come back and discuss them and we're going to see how this applies to our projects. Yeah, work is joy for some of us. So, the idea of a four-hour work week is not to get the hours less. It's to get doing what you want to do. It's about learning how to do less of that stuff. But anyway, I think they get the point. Yeah. Uh, another one I do kind of want to bring up just personal finance mm -hmm. um, and the one book that I would recommend is Ramit Sethi's um, I Will Teach You To Be Rich. It's kind of a like a mm -hmm. no BS book where it's like, you know, the whole, the, the way you save money is you cut costs and you, and you uh, spend more money on the things you really want to do um, and he just, it's, it's enlightening to see how much we're spending on things we really don't need to be spending on. Um, and this book just kind of helps you work through that and, and figure out where you can cut costs and spend more on things that will make a bigger difference. How do you spell his name? Ramit is R-A-M-I-T. Sethi is S-A-T-H-I. Um, he also has a website. Um, he's been around for a long time. I think he, back when blogs were popular, he had a very... I will teach you to be rich dot com, I think. Um, and you could just find a bunch of articles and, and blog posts that he's written and just learn from that as well. You don't have to even probably buy the book, but it's not expensive. Um, but yeah, he, he he has a really fun writing style. Um, so it's an entertaining read. Personal finance is important because, you know, as artists, we don't make much money, most of us. And so, like, you got to be able to. You, you have to be smart with it. It's one of those things that I've just neglected to pay attention to. And so, I have a son who's paid tremendous mm. attention to so as not to be like dad. Oh, to not be like dad. <laughs> you need to read this book then. I do. Yeah. Marshall, I feel like I've, I've gone through too many. Can you bring up one or two? How, what is the category that we're describing here right now? These are self-help books. These the are- Self-help and biz business and, and- Yeah, it's in a dearth of my education. I just have not paid that much attention to these things. I paid more attention. I, I was thinking even in preparation for this that when I was a student in college, I would make a point to hang out in the library in the afternoon and pull books off the shelf that I would read all the way through the book over a period of weeks. Uh, and one that had a big influence on me had nothing to do with finance. It had to do with communication. It was, uh, it was called, it was Lionel Ruby 
was the author, and I think it was called The Art of Making Sense. Mm. And it was just such a clear book on how thinking should follow patterns of clarity. Mm. And it was something I struggled with and still do. But that had a big influence on me just personally. And then there was another one called How to Write, Speak, and Think More Effectively. These are books that are probably from the 70s. Uh, the author was Rudolf Flesch, if I recall, R-U-D-O-L-F, uh, F-L-E-S-C-H. And I remember that book was so profound in my life. Those two books, which I read within the same year, and Rudolf Flesch had another one that was important to me, The Art of Clear Thinking. I poured over those three books, going through every paragraph and trying to understand that what comes out of your mouth can confuse or clarify, that what comes out of your mouth can build up or tear down. And they did not make any kind of uh, moral or ethical argument. Uh, I had enough of that uh, as an understanding. There's a responsibility to communicate clearly. But these were how-to books of how to make sense and how to make it so that what comes out of your mouth will make a difference. And I owe a debt to I don't, I don't know anything about those authors. I never even owned those books. <laughs> it's just that I spent months of pulling them off the library shelf and absorbing them the best I could at the time. And I was neglecting other things like how to invoice a client and how to prepare for your taxes <laughs> and how to save money properly. <laughs> Well, you know, those things are better delegated anyway. How do you mean? Those are the things that in the four-hour work week, those are the things you would try to get rid of out of your work week. Invoicing your clients. You mean dealing with finance stuff? Yeah, like invoicing taxes. Yeah, those are the things that you would try to delegate to other people or try to find a service online to some tool online that'll make it really easy to do that stuff. That's not stuff you want to learn how to do really well. Uh -huh. that's, a, that's a waste of your time. <laughs> Unless you want to be, you know, a tax guy. What I'm trying to say is I think you probably made the right decision <laughs> in focusing on communicating properly because, I mean, that book or those two books, are they about specifically speaking or about communicating? Above all, more than anything else I remember about them, they were about trains of thought. Ah, okay. They were about that when we, when we speak or write or communicate, we're taking the wheel and going in a direction and that it's not a good thing to grab the wheel and take it into reckless directions, which I found out how much I needed that by my friend and I recording our conversations and then listening back to them and feeling deep embarrassment, humiliation, regret, guilt over how reckless the conversation can be because I was part of Interesting. it. And uh, those were, they were mentors. Those, those authors were mentors to say, let's do this well if we can. Well, do you think the books would uh, apply to teaching? Because I mean, with teaching, you have to be clear in the way you communicate. Yeah. Um, also, just being an artist, you're yeah. storytelling, you're communicating. Art is a language, you know, it's a visual language. Yeah. Do you think these books apply to that or is it yeah. literally just like speaking? I don't think that they have much of an uh, application to picture making, no. Okay. Uh, they have an application to the use of words to the guide words. Thoughts. Okay. And I, even in talking about them now, I recognize that I need to go back to those. I have some students who would say, yeah, you need to go back to those books. <laughs> Donald Hall also had a book called Writing Well that he likened writing to being a guide on a tour and your job is to help people get through the tour without tripping, which means that you've got to know the direction you're going very well to guide them well. Mm. Okay, but no, I, I really have neglected uh, books about life organization and I regret having done so, but that's why I'm glad to hear and Tim Ferriss's The 4-Hour Workweek would be a good book to spend a month in and see how it affects the coming year's schedules and priorities and decisions. Yeah, there's a lot. There's mm -hmm. so many good books on this kind of stuff. I know. I spent a really uh, large part of my 20s and late teens going through these books um, and also just listening to interviews and, and podcasts. Uh, but I, I guess I'll go through the, the, I only have a few left. Go ahead. 
Seth Godin is an uh, he's an author I've mentioned several times, and yeah. he's he's got a lot of books. Um, I haven't read all of them, but I've I've read a few, a handful. I think the one that really applies to artists the most is Lynchpin. Tell us about it. It's it's really about people who do things in their own way. It's about how to be be someone who's indispensable, basically. Um, I think it's even part of the title. Hmm. I think artists have to be this way. That sounds wonderful. So, Lynchpin is the one that you would recommend to artists as far as their career, how they become valuable in the economy? I think so. Seth is a marketer. He's all, most of the books is, are somehow related to marketing and advertising. Mm-hmm. So, some of his books are geared towards businesses and some are geared towards um, artists and independent creators who need to run as a business, right? Like, you, you need to promote yourself. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm actually excited about reading his new book. I, I, while researching, you know, preparing for this episode, I, I came across it. It's called The Practice, Shipping Creative Work. So, it's, it's about pr- delivering product to your customers? I think it's, it's basically about putting your best work out there. I don't know what that really means and how he approaches that, but I haven't read it, but I, I'm excited to. Yeah. Two other books that I've read that I really liked with him and they apply to me just because I of what I do. Uh, one is Tribes and that's about getting groups of people together, you know, creating community. What I've read of that book, I like very much and I, I feel like that's one that I want to take seriously in the yeah. coming years. To instead of making a bigger audience, yes. make a smaller group a focused where we tribe. are in contact with each other. Yeah, focused to do our yeah. best work. In February, we're starting that with the composition training and the workshop with Vance Kovacs. Uh, the other one is Purple Cow, which is I think it's most more for like advertising for companies. Uh, but the 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 message there is create good product so that you get word of mouth. Because that's the best advertising. Um, be the purple cow that stands out and everybody talks about. <laughs> mm-hmm. But anyway, yeah, Seth Godin, just literally throw a dart and you'll get a good one. He has a re- really good podcast too. I regularly listen to it. Um, huh. Quick, you yeah. know, 20 minute episodes. And he has Q&As at the end from people. We should try to make our podcast more like his. <laughs> This is so well done. Well, I wouldn't mind that in 2021 that we are going to decide we'll we'll use him as a an influence to see how he does it better than what we've been doing <laughs> and what we can integrate into yeah. what we're doing. <laughs> well, he's also just like a genius. Yeah, I admire him very much. And I love that he's bald. That's How many more do you <laughs> that's have? That's weird. Um, let's see. How many more do I got? I got 0 to 1 by Peter Thiel. Uh E-Myth, Gary uh-huh. Vaynerchuk. In general, he's another author that I just uh-huh. really like, um, and more so just just uh, on his online presence. Stan, I, we've got so many. I think we need to do more book reports this year. Yeah, Marshall, we've been getting requests for it anyway. <laughs> yeah, we have been. Um, I think okay. So I want to do a survey. Mm-hmm. This is the season finale. We're gonna do. Uh, season three, probably what April first or whatever the first Tuesday in April. That's when season three will start. Somewhere around there. Me and you, Marshall, we're gonna use the first three months of next year to really plan out season three and figure out what we're gonna do with it. But you guys, the listeners, I would like your help. We're gonna put out a. We're gonna have a little survey. We're gonna ask some questions to really figure out what you guys like about the podcast, what you don't, where do you want it to go. So. It would really help us if you go to proca.com slash, uh, what, should, what should it be? Uh, season three survey. Yeah, three, the number three. And there will also be a link in the description. And please ha- let us know your thoughts. Um, we'll try to make the survey as quick as possible so you don't have to waste your time. Um, but yeah. And we'll pay attention to it too. We'll hear you. We'll pay attention to it. I really want to know, do people want more book reviews? Um, do people want more voicemails um do they want to bring back what's your thing <laughs> you know do they want more guests 
do the, you know all, all this stuff we want to know what which direction should we head towards with season three so please help us out uh you mentioned some fiction books what what, what are the fiction books that are on your list oh yeah i have three of my favorite fiction books and they're all it's funny they're all like sci-fi kind of fun sci-fi that you know very technology uh-huh. related that, um so the first one off to be a wizard was such a fun book um, the premise is uh, this programmer discovers a file. He realizes that once he makes a change to it, it actually changes things around him. It's a file that controls time and space or whatever. It's like we are built on code. This whole thing is 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 just a simulation and he discovered the file that controls the simulation. So, he uses it to go back in time to be a wizard. <laughs> huh. It's really fun. It's it's funny. Um so that one's probably my favorite. Um and I think there's uh there's two or three more books in the series. The other one is Ready Player One. There was a movie that came out, it was really big, um, uh, but I think the book was much better. Uh and the other one is The Martian, which also had a mo- the, a movie that came out. Oh, the one that Ridley Scott directed that had Matt Damon? Yeah, it had Matt Damon in it. Uh, the movie was good, but I, the book went into a lot more detail into how he survived and the challenges he went through. And it was just, it was, it was, the, bo- the book was better. Um, so, those three are my favorite uh, fiction books. Actually, I do have one fiction book that is a collection of short stories by Kurt Vonnegut called Welcome to the Monkey House. There are about 12 short stories in here that are so wonderful. Some of them only take 10, 15 minutes to read. Uh, Actually, the title one, Welcome to the Monkey House, is one of my least favorite of the bunch. But when I read this uh, a couple years ago, I immediately, when I finished it, read the whole book again, and then some of the stories several times since. If you like short stories, and if you like Kurt Vonnegut, or if you don't like Kurt Vonnegut, this is stuff that he started writing probably from the 50s into the 60s or 70s, uh, and they were for very different clients, uh, including Ladies Home Journal, Playboy, Saturday Evening Post, uh, Colliers, I think. Uh, But every market, every audience, he changes the flavor of how he writes to appeal to that market. And a dozen of them are just knockout little short stories. I want to shift it to another subject. Okay. This is sort of in between art books and Mm self-help. As a college student, I got interested in books on creativity because I wanted to know what makes people really creative. The people that I admired Almost all of them were not people who acted heroically particularly. They were just people who did extraordinarily good work. There was a book that Rollo May came out called The Courage to Create. I remember reading that. I remember liking it. I don't know if I recommend it. There was one called Creativity Road to Self-Discovery by some guy with a PhD. I don't even remember his name, Edward or Cyan or Ryan or something like that. But uh, I read those books again uh, on my breaks between classes in college, and they helped me understand some things about it. But then over after reading about 30 books and, and going through cassette courses on creativity over the years, when I found the one that I espouse the highest, Gabriel Rico's Writing the Natural Way, this is a woman who teaches you to write poetry by using a technique called clustering that's wonderful. And that's where I stopped reading creativity books. I didn't need any more. That one is going to be the thing that I want to use to be creative. And then, even though I have not been through Sterling Huntley's course, even though I mentioned it before, Sterling Huntley's course as students who were taking it were showing me what they were doing in his classes seemed like, all right, that's the other uh, practical creativity course. I don't really need to study creativity more. I just need to do it. Yeah. However, in the last several months, I'm recognizing how with classes, there is a technical aspect and a creative aspect. And the technical aspect is what most people know that they need because they can't draw with the knowledge of anatomy and perspective and rendering and all those other things. But the creative aspect is becoming more interesting to me because I'm learning more about it. 
I'm not learning new things about it, but I'm learning things about it that excite me as a teacher. Mm -hmm. uh, that Gerard Puccio, uh, great courses on the Creative Thinkers Toolkit. I'd like to use that not as a textbook, but as a text, an audio text uh, for students who want to really get their head around what science shows us through research about how creativity works. And then the opposite of that is just one of the best creativity books, not from a scientist, but from a cartoonist that takes you all over the place of what it takes to be a cartoonist and the craziness and the surreality of the process. And it's anything but scientific, but it's from a guy who countless thousands of cartoons he chose for The New Yorker, and he even contributed some very good ones himself. And he was the editor of The New Yorker cartoons. And uh, he claims early on that cartoonists are the most creative people in the world. It's the most creative profession in the world. And you could argue against that. <laughs> but if you grant that, all right, let's run with that. Why are cartoonists the most creative people in the world? And just play along for a while. He gives you wonderful lessons in creativity and the book is funny. So, I want to take three or four of my favorite sources for creativity. And because co-reading, when we re read the Talent Code together within the same month, I just really enjoy that because now you're reading it not only to discuss the practicality of it and how it relates to what we're working on now, but it also creates a kind of bonding with the person that you're sharing the thought with. Uh, but there's another thing about this creativity business. And that is, you told me about fishing for elephants. Yep. I would like a report on that. Yeah, I'm not done with that one. I have a book that's been on my shelf for years. It doesn't even have the author's name on the cover, but the author is David D. Edwards, and the book is called How to Be More Creative. And it is, I mean, you couldn't have a less creative title. Fishing for Elephants may be a creative title. Uh, how to be more creative is hardly creative. And it's done in typewriter font. And he's even got <laughs> lots of blank spaces in the book uh. so that you can type notes. And if you say, well, I don't know about that book. Seems like he's weaseling out on content. This book has great content. I went through it just this last month in preparation for this. This is such a good book for training people over a period of, say, two to three months of how to be creative that I want to build a course around it with as, as a textbook. But it is out of print. Interesting. It is not going to impress you as a book. But the content and the understanding that this guy had of the creative process using the stuff that advertising agencies and cartoonists and other people who make their living with idea after idea after idea and having to have good ideas, this is a wonderful little source, an unimpressive mm. but dense with understanding and content book. It would be interesting for us to compare the similarities between that book and Fishing for Elephants because I think from what you've just described, it seems like they're very similar. They have the same yeah. exact goal. I mean, the subtitle of Fishing for Elephants is Insights and Exercises to Inspire Authentic Creativity. Yeah. Okay. It's basically how to be creative, right? I mean, <laughs> I want to do book reports on these. I think we should have one, yeah. one session where we each bring the best out of it. I think season three for sure will have both of these book reports. Um, okay. So, we'll see. That brings me to um, something I wanted to talk about in this episode is my, um, I have a media to-do list, which is just uh, books and, and workshops and, you know, courses and audiobooks that I want to digest at some point. Mm -hmm. um, so, this is like my reading list for the future. These are books that I'm excited about. One I already mentioned is the Seth Godin book, Fishing for Elephants, I'm currently reading. An audiobook that I'm currently listening to is The Second Machine Age, mm -hmm. uh, Progress and Prosperity in a Time of Brilliant Technologies. Um, that one's more for because I'm interested in AI and, and just how technology improves. And so, that's more for people that like that kind of stuff. Um, another one, 
Oh, I'm really excited about Anti-Fragile. Yeah, I have heard of Anti-Fragile. Remind me. Basically, it's um, you look for times in your life, moments throughout your day where you are, you have stress and any kind of stress could make you stronger. It's a bring it on attitude. Yeah. Remember, I have not read this yet. So, <laughs> this is what I'm excited about. But I think it's basically about how to become anti-fragile using stress in your life to, to grow stronger. Well, that sounds great. That's a great attitude. It's basically making yourself so that the more stress that is put on you, the stronger you become. Um, so, more stress becomes good for you in that sense. Wonderful. I mean, a lot of things actually work that way. It seems counterintuitive. Mm -hmm. Um, but a lot of things work that way, like your muscles. The more stress you give to your muscles, the stronger the muscles become. That's how they grow. That's great to hear. That's encouraging. Yeah, nature kind of just works that way. So, that's my, my list of to-dos that I'm excited about in the near future. Okay, there's two more books I want to mention. Yep. And they are, I just found them at Barnes & Noble. The first one was called The Greatest Decisions Ever, History's Biggest Ideas and the People Who Made Them. It was only 10 bucks, so I figured I'll buy it. They had another one right next to it called The Greatest Blunders Ever, History's Dumbest <laughs> Mistakes and the People Who Made Them. I figured <laughs> I That's would cool. buy The Greatest Decisions Ever and meditate on the positive ones. Why, why commune with the negative ones? But I thought, well, it was only five bucks, I'll buy it. The two are companionate. Yeah. The thing that I liked about them is that the greatest decisions ever, the fourth one is hunter-gatherers settle down and start farming. That's greatest decisions ever. Yeah. The greatest blunders ever, <laughs> the first one is called humans domesticate plants and animals. Ooh. So, it's the same thing. Hmm that about 10 to 12,000 years ago, apparently, we decided to stop being hunter-gatherers and why not make farms and do agriculture? And that it was the worst thing that we could have done in a number of ways. But then, if we hadn't done it, we wouldn't be doing this podcast right now. So, it was both a great thing and a terrible thing. And there are only like four pages per each great decision or blunder. But it's such a macro view. And one of the first things I like to do say in a creativity class, is to say, let's pull up, get as big a macro view as we can about what creativity is, and also look to some resources creatively that are not courses in creativity. I think that these two books, focusing in each book on 50 things that are the worst things humans ever did in history, and the best things humans supposedly ever did in history, that to focus in on those things and to say, what can we learn from them about great big macro tipping points that the world went this way or another way? And can we extract any principles from them? I don't know. I, I spent last night an hour and a half in these books just to get prepared for today and was thinking, I will go through every page of one of these and would love to do it in community and discussion with others. Man, Mar it's so interesting how we're like, we have two opposite focuses, mm -hmm. but it, it, you know, both are extremely important. You're focusing on history and what has been, and then I'm focusing on the future and what will be, like, you know, the, the second, the one I'm reading or, or listening to right now is the second machine, yeah. which is about technology <laughs> and how things will, preparing for how that's going to change the world. The, I, the book is basically about how you know, things are going to change dramatically in the, in the coming future because of what technology is going to allow. And we've just been so wrong in the past about how quickly things will change. Yeah. But it's, it's super important to look back as well, like with both of those together. Because without looking back, you're not going to be able to look forward, right? You have to combine the two. I love that. We had a, we had a balance we yeah. didn't even plan on, but that you yeah. were, Dry, yeah. <laughs> you're, you're looking forward, you're in the car looking forward and I'm looking back to see who's uh, who's following us and what was back there. Yeah. Yeah. So, I'll, I'd love to uh, hear your report on that. <laughs> well, I enjoyed this but I feel like we need, we need another many, many, many hours. Yeah. Yeah. This is a discussion that obviously is 
not meant for a podcast. Yeah, it, 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 <laughs> but we tried. We tried, Marshall. I think we did okay. And, and I think we'll do better if we do what we did before, <laughs> where we report on each other to books. This way, we hold each other accountable to make some pretty good yeah. synopses of longer books and say, can you, in a matter of a half hour, mm-hmm. uh, boil down the best of this and also have back and forth uh, questioning about it? And it also gives us deadlines to read a book and prepare something and means that as as we've talked about before, that when you're teaching something, you learn it better than the people who you are teaching it to. And oh, I would yeah. love to do more book reports, but we'll find out. We'll find out what yeah. the people who listen to this podcast want from us. Yeah. Um, to end it on a, on a fun note, um, and also it's related to the whole technology thing, um, Open AI which is Elon Musk's AI company, mm-hmm. um, recently launched a language, a natural language AI tool um, that is trained on almost the entire internet and it works incredibly. It's, it's, it's currently in beta but I got access to it and I, this morning I try, <laughs> I tried using it to write book reports <laughs> and it actually works all right. Huh. It's, it's amazing. This, this AI is just incredible. It's, it's language based and so the, basically the way it works is it's really good at predicting the next word mm-hmm. and it, if you just do that over and over again, it'll, it can write an essay what for you. Trip. Yeah, it's incredible but, but it, it, it takes a little bit of skill to like write a prompt for it because basically it's like you give it you tell it something and then it responds to you um and you could you could say whatever you want i mean it, literally it's it's just it's a language thing and so the way i approached it was i said i summarize books with five big ideas and then after that i gave it an example book uh the five love languages by gary chapman and then the five big ideas, one, two, three, four, five, with, with you know, written out the five big ideas from that book. Uh, then I gave it another example, I Will Teach You to Be Rich by Ramit Sethi and the five big ideas from that. And then after that, I gave it a book title and it, you could put whatever you want in there and then you say the five big ideas and then you end it there and then you say submit and what it does is it predicts the next, whatever the next words wow. are for that, which based on the prompt they gave it would be the five big ideas from whatever book I input there. So, Marshall, which book do you want to get a book report from this AI? The uh, the Seth Godin uh, linchpin one. Okay, it's generate. Okay, it's done. Here's the five big okay. ideas from Let's this hear. book. Number one, make work about more than just money. Okay. Number two, work on stuff that matters and add value to the world. Three, the internet is giving us all a voice and it's time we use it to start talking about work itself. Okay. Four, design your own job and find ways to be indispensable at any company or in any industry. Wow. Five, every life is a design project. Why not make yours one you <laughs> care about? This is this is not a tool that was designed to write book reports. This is all it does is it responds to you in a natural language. And it, it did that because it knows the text of the book? No, it did that because it knows the entire internet, which there's plenty of people on the internet talking about Lynchpin by Seth Godin. And so what it does is it it predicts what people would say in this in this context. Unbelievable. It doesn't understand anything. It doesn't know that it's doing this. It doesn't know what linchpin is about. It simply predicts the next word over and over and over again. And because it was trained on the entire internet, it's really good at predicting the next word based on what everyone on the internet has said in the past. Um, It's not always accurate. You know, not everyone on the internet tells the truth. Mm Mm-hmm. And because it's trained on everything, it sometimes lies. Mm-hmm. It's sometimes racist. It's sometimes really rude. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes just goes on tangents of about something unrelated. Wow. Um, so it's trained on the good parts of the internet and the really bad parts of the internet as well. But when you kind of cater it, give it real a really focused uh-huh. thing, like what I just did, it's actually really good at doing that. 
I am more than overwhelmed. It's just, it, it is, it, what, what can you say? I mean, you can say, what a trip. Oh, awesome. Un unbelievable. Yeah. All of those things. Well, yeah, well, let's use it. Can I do a test? What's What book did you recently read that if I put it in here, you'll know that it did a good job or not? Well, I've reread uh, The Naked Cartoonist a couple times, but I don't know that it would how much it would have from that. Well, let's see. Yeah. Let's see. <laughs> I don't... Um... Yeah, it might it, it might actually if the internet doesn't have much about that book, it might just start talking about like naked people and cartoonists. But let's let's see what happens. I'm actually really curious. Okay. Okay, the five big ideas. And you tell me how accurate this is. Um also I want to just point out that if I generate it again, it'll say something completely different. Uh huh. Because it kind of takes on a personality. It, it's like if you ask a hundred people who read this book, what are the five big ideas? They're all say something different. Okay. Um, and so, asking this AI every time you generate, it'll be like asking someone about it. So, this could be like asking someone who really didn't pay attention. Okay. <laughs> you know, but let's see. So, number one, if you can make people laugh, you can make them do anything. I don't remember that. If you can make people laugh, you'll have okay. an audience. You'll, you'll, you might have a living, but I don't remember anything about you can make them do anything. Maybe it was in there, but go, go ahead. Okay. Number two, a cartoonist's job is to get laughs, but not at the expense of the truth. I don't remember that in particular, but go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> okay, maybe. okay. The funniest cartoons are often those that are most brutally honest and self-deprecating. Uh, there's There was something along those lines. Yeah, that's that's been a theme okay. with him. Honesty is the best humor policy, even if it makes means taking some risks. Oh, that's that's oh, that's definitely a Bob Mankoff thing. Yeah. Okay. And number five, you have a cartoon in you. Find it and let it out. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Well, that was not bad. And even those first three that okay. I was a little confused on might be the fact that I've been reading a number of books uh, on cartooning, but that was very good. Well, no, it's the first two Hobby that you said no to. The third one you said maybe. So, okay. So, maybe you got two and a half out of five. Bob Mankoff may hate it. Stan, you're showing us what you talked about last year about uh, education and a, if somebody giving us the five big ideas where it can be generated that quickly so that if we say, what do I need to know about this book, this book, this book, this book, it's going to give us synopses. I don't know. Even, do, we don't even need to do this podcast. We just need to have the AI do us the five big ideas and then elaborate and elaborate and teach us. Yeah. I mean, it's possible that in 10 years, y it will be more worth your time to talk to an AI than to a real human. It may be. Uh, <laughs> just like, you know, you could set different parameters. Be like, I want this AI to only tell me facts. Yeah. You know, don't give me lies. T tell me, I want to learn something from you. So go only give me scientifically proven facts. And then you start talking to it. Or you say, I want to talk to someone funny. And so this AI just is just hilarious. You just have this funny conversation with this AI. Um, well, I am amazed. Yeah. Thanks for sharing this. This is something we've got to take. I wouldn't mind taking this up often. Yeah, I think in season three, I'm going to do something with this. Yeah. Um, I've been experimenting with it in um, trying to make it a tool for artists. Um, but it does have some limitations in the way... Um, OpenAI have, has allowed people to use it, mm -hmm. which you can't input too much, too much text. And also you can't limit it. Like, for example, I was thinking like, if we take all of our books in our bookshelves mm -hmm. that we know are trusted sources and we say, hey, based on these 200 books, create a chatbot. If students ask a question, you answer the question with accuracy based on the information from these 200 books. That's totally possible, but be, but they have limited how much input we can give it. Um, and so, we can't just input the text of 200 books into it. Um, but I'm pretty sure in a few years, we'll be able to do something yeah. like this and we'll have a chat bot that students can ask questions and just and get an accurate answer from. And I'm so excited. To, to play around with that kind of stuff. I'm excited too. I want to hang around while it's happening. Yeah. I don't need to be the teacher. I can be a fellow student and we'll let the AI be our teacher. But keep in mind, we are still the teachers. Humans are still teachers in the, in the scenario I just described where we're inputting like 200 books that yeah. we trust and we're saying, hey, AI, based on this information, answer our mm -hmm. questions. 
we're still going off of knowledge of yeah. humans, right? Um, we're just now using an AI to predict what these 200 authors would say. Yeah. But anyway, I just wanted to leave it at that fun note because this was a little experiment I was doing this morning and it, it, it took me like 15 minutes to, to try it out and it worked so freaking well. Okay. Well, I hope you enjoy your holidays and your new fatherhood and, and new family life. Thank you, Marshall. We'll talk in January about what we're going to do next. Happy holidays. And please take that survey in the comments or in the, from the description. See you next year. I'll see a number of you in class in January and February. Bye, Stan. Bye, Marshall. There's been no food on this podcast so far. Well, Stan's had his matcha and I've had my black coffee. But here we have a grape tomato. In case you think it's fake, and I'm going to eat it. Mmm.